Hello everyone and welcome back to this module on quantum chemistry. And in this particular module we are going to be extending from where we left off in the first lecture of the series. Uh let's do a quick recapitulation of what we did there. We started out with a particle making a circular motion around the central nucleus. And this type of a uh, motion of a particle is also called as a rigid rotor. So say for example if the particle is at a distance r from the nucleus and has a mass of me then the motion that it makes can either be dealt with as a planar motion which is also called as particle in a ring the advantage being that we are only going to have to deal with two uh, coordinates which is x and y and this can very well be extrapolated to the spherical movement of this particle and this uh, spherical motion uh, or a spherical rigid rotor would then end up having all three coordinates of x y and z right and like any other quantum mechanical system the fundamental uh, expression which is required to define the state of the system is nothing but the total energy operator that is hamiltonian and which is where we began with our discussion here and we said that the hamiltonian itself has an expression of minus h square 8 pi square m del square upon del x square plus del square over del y square and this is typically because we were considering a particle in a ring having only coordinates of x comma y right then we trace back a little to our previous semester's coursework on quantum mechanics to understand the origin of this expression and to be able to do that we went back all the way to the wave function psi which has dependence on both displacement as well as time then we did something which is classic uh, for uh, quantum mechanics that is separation of variables and we are going to come back to separation of variables even in this semester's coursework because we would have an r equation a, a theta and a phi equation so there has to be separation of variables done uh, suitably even for the coursework that we have at hand uh, for this semester right so after separating the variables we went ahead and applied the de broglie's relationship and after applying the de broglie's relationship we ended up with an expression for hamiltonian which looked like minus 8 square over 8 pi square m del square plus v right now what are these two terms the del square over here is also called as laplacian okay and in the upcoming uh, lectures we are going to be discussing a little uh more detail of uh, the laplacian operator and how to convert the laplacian operator from the cartesian coordinates of x y and z into spherical polar coordinates right so this is nothing but your uh, del square over del x square plus del square over del y square plus del square over del z square right and v out here is nothing but the potential energy okay so moving on from there we have the hamiltonian to be equal to minus 8 square over 8 pi square m del square plus v now how does this get converted into the hamiltonian expression for rigid rotor that we started out with in the previous lecture the reason being for a rigid rotor all the energy happens to be kinetic right because there is always a change of uh, velocity that means the particle is continuously being accelerated in which case our potential energy then goes to zero and secondly if you are considering a particle in a ring then we are not involving the third coordinate z we are only looking at the coordinates x and y so thereby our expression h cap then becomes reduced to minus h square over 8 pi square m del square over del x square plus del square over del y square right and this can be applied to uh psi and then eventually we can start discussing how the expression quantum mechanical expression in rigid rotor works right 
so that is a brief overview of what we've done previously now what is it that we aim to do today is a few things that um, are imminent in our discussion with rigid rotor is to first um, convert the schrodinger's equation from cartesian coordinate system to the spherical polar coordinate system so the cartesian coordinates which have x y and z have to be replaced by the spherical polar coordinates of r phi and theta and to be able to do that we require to convert the laplacian operator from the cartesian coordinates of x y and z into the spherical polar coordinates of r phi and theta right and before we do that we are tracing back we need a relationship to express x y and z in terms of r phi and theta so that we can eventually apply it in the derivatives involved in the laplacian to be able to define laplacian in the spherical polar coordinates and eventually put the laplacian into the schrodinger's equation in terms of the spherical polar coordinates to get the equation itself in spherical polar coordinates right so that's uh, the uh, final aim uh, of doing what we are doing now before we get uh, right there let's look at our cartesian system and try and see how it gets converted into the spherical polar coordinates let's say for example this is a system a coordinate system uh, whereby there are three mutually perpendicular axes and any particle that's present anywhere can be defined by the relative positions x comma y comma z when it is being represented according to the cartesian system but what we now want to do is fundamentally transform this into the three variables involved in the spherical polar coordinates which is r phi and theta right now whenever we are expressing the coordinates there are some fundamental norms or thumb rules that we have to follow which are also uh, universally accepted and majority of the text follow the same rule right so when you are writing out the axis it's usually done so in a counterclockwise manner you can imagine the fleming's left hand rule so it's like an index finger coming out towards you sorry the middle finger coming out towards you then you have an index finger going here and you have a thumb going up right so in that way you can try and uh, visualize the three mutually perpendicular axes and these mutually perpendicular axes are always written in the counterclockwise form so if you start from x here the middle finger pointing towards you then y becomes the index finger and z becomes the thumb right so these are uh, basic conventions which are followed so that uh, everyone gets uh, to the same answer or there is no uh, ambiguity with respect to what we are talking about all right so if say for example i connect this to the origin now this uh, point can be projected on different planes say for example if i do a projection of this point on the xy plane you come and drop down to a point here if i label this point as p and this point as p dash this p dash will also be can be connected from the origin to form a right angle triangle opp dash right and we are going to be using a lot of trigonometry and uh, uh, so to be able to apply the basic uh, uh, trigonometric ratios i require a large number of right and right angle triangles to be able to do that so that happens to be your first right angle triangle right the second one is i could extrapolate this p dash in a line that is perpendicular to the y axis and i could call this as a c for example where a p dash is nothing but equal to o b say for example and o b is nothing but the y component of the coordinate system right and if at all i extrapolate this over to this axis here i get the third point let me label this as c and this coc happens to be equal to pp dash and this oc is nothing but the z component of the coordinate system 
so i have all these defined now let's ha- look at a few more conventions the euclidean distance between o and the position of the particle p is given by r okay so in uh, in various books you are going to see different uh, notations either r or it is sometimes uh, given as rho as well but it depends on from text to text so we'll be using r as our convention over here so this is the distance between uh, the origin and the particle uh, position of the particle itself okay now the angle that it makes with uh, the z axis over here is given as theta okay these are all the conventions that we usually follow right and the second angle is the angle that the projection of the particle makes on the xy plane to that of the x axis is given by phi right so now rather than defining the coordinates of the particle with the uh, typical cartesian co- coordinate system of x y and z we will be doing that with reference to r theta and phi so once r theta and phi are defined for a particle then it is uh, uh, you know it's very clear as to what is the state of the particle that's very clearly defined just like it would have been if you had defined x y and z uh, coordinates for the particle all right so now we need to transform the x y and the z into r theta and phi right so let's look at the z axis first and we are looking at the triangle uh o p c right it's a tri- right angle triangle and the right angle happens to be here right because it's a projection on the axis okay so now i can have um, say by definition i could uh, look at cos theta which is nothing which is going to be nothing but uh adjacent over hypotenuse right so the adjacent side over here happens to be oc over the hypotenuse happens to be op so i get cos theta is equal to oc is nothing but my z component and op is nothing but r so i have z to be equal to r cos theta so that's my first relationship that i'll write down in shelf here right okay so let's look now at defining the z uh, the y and the x components now the y component happens to be ob and uh, the x component happens to be oa once i've defined these two then i know exactly the cartesian coordinates of the point p which is lying in this uh, space right now to be able to do that i'm looking at the equilateral uh, the right angle triangle aop dash right and this uh, right angle triangle also has a 90 degree angle that is oap dash and i have the angle phi so if i define sin phi i get sin phi to be opposite the opposite side happens to be ap dash upon the hypotenuse the hypotenuse happens to be op dash right now i need a relationship for op dash with respect to r okay and uh, i don't need to go back much uh, just that i have to trace back to how i get uh, how i uh, got the z coordinate in that i was looking at the right angle triangle opc and why is it that this triangle is going to help me in the subsequent calculations for the coordinates of y and x is because op is equal to op dash right so if op is equal to op dash then looking at the triangle opc so uh, i should have cp is equal to op dash right so it's a part of uh, a rectangle so these are the opposite sides of the rectangle so these two sides are equal right so now i need to get a relationship for cp 
Now CP is nothing but the opposite side of the triangle OPC. So if it is the opposite side, I can define uh, sine theta as CP over OP, where uh, CP would then turn out to be R sine theta, right? And we've already established that CP is equal to OP dash, right? So now what we are going to be doing is we'll replace the OP dash with uh, the expression that we've got there. So I end up with sine phi is equal to AP dash over R sine theta. And AP dash is equal to OB because we have once again opposite sides of a rectangle. And OB is nothing but Y. So therefore I can write down Y is equal to R sine theta sine phi. This happens to be my second expression here. Can you pause this video and now think about how do we get the x variable to transform into the spherical polar coordinates? I think we've done some good headway in defining the z variable as well as the y variable. Now to get to the x variable, you are looking at the very same triangle A, O, P dash. So just take a moment and think about how do you get the x coordinate to transform into the spherical polar coordinates. Alright, so let's just work that out. So rather than taking the sine of the angle uh, phi, let's now look at cosine of the angle phi. Cosine of the angle phi would then be adjacent which is OA over hypotenuse which is OB dash. OA is nothing but uh, x and plus we've already got uh, OP dash to be equal to R sine theta so I'm just going to write x over R sine theta so I end up getting x is equal to R sine theta cos phi. So that is how I transform the x, the y and the z variable from the Cartesian coordinate system to the spherical coordinate system of r, phi and t. Right? So just assimilate how these expressions work out and in the next video we are going to be looking at transforming the Laplacian from its Cartesian coordinates of x, y and z into spherical coordinates. We'll see you on the other side.